I was thinking this morning in doing the lesson on holiness and how we're to be holy even as he is holy, being the first of the year and the first Sunday in which we assembled. And I began to think about the affairs of this present world in this nation, in the world, especially where we are. And when you think of the sins that are rampant throughout the land, seemingly getting worse, you cannot help but think about, well, where are the sins committed? Who's committing them? And I thought of an Old Testament account that we're all familiar with. I think of the biblical account of Joseph, and I think it's a favorite to most of us. We've known it since we were little children, our mother's knee. And I think it's, though, a favorite for all generations. And I think there are many lessons to be learned from it. In one place, and the last several chapters of Genesis cover all of this, after the brothers of Joseph had gone down into Egypt. Reuben had this to say to his brothers concerning Joseph. Spake I not unto you, saying, Do not sin against the child, and ye would not hear? Therefore, behold, also his blood is required. Genesis 42, 22. Obviously, one can sin against somebody else. And in this case, Joseph's own fleshly brothers sinned against him, and they sold him into Egypt for slaves. And as Joseph would say to them, you meant this for evil, but God worked it for good because in the providential workings, his brothers and all of their families, his father and so forth, were saved from the terrible famine that swept the land. There's a great lesson in that and that God will help us even when we think there's no help available and we don't know where it's coming from. Amen. Thus, the title for our sermon today, Do Not Sin Against the Child. And as I said a moment ago, when I think of the sins of this nation today, so many of those sins are against children. And there are many ways that men can be guilty of sinning against their children. So for a little while, I'd like for us to consider some of those. Think of the children that are refused medical treatment. You say, what, in this land? Well, there are some religions, some Pentecostal religions, some teaching that miracles are still today. We would call them faith healers, or they call themselves that. And many of these Pentecostals are sincere people who try to live what they believe. And in various cases, sundry cases, some have refused to give their children medical treatment because of their belief that going to a doctor means that you have lack of faith in God to heal. I think it's interesting to realize that when it comes to medicine, and I'm talking about the practice of medicine by trained and qualified physicians and other medical people, we fail to realize that the body, as God has made it, heals itself. I want you to think about that for a minute. You break your arm, the people that are qualified can set the arm. May even require surgery to have some sort of pin put in it or something like this. But the body heals itself. You have to have an uh, appendectomy. Because the appendix has become infected, and if you don't, it can rupture and kill a person, and has many times. 
But the body heals itself. A surgeon simply takes out the bad appendix. The body heals itself. You have a severe infection. Medicine is given, usually antibiotic or more than one. What's causing the infection is destroyed. The body even has certain defenses against it. But the body, as God made it, heals itself. And you can go on and on and on. In fact, some of the cancer research has been to try to cause the body's own defenses to be able to uh, handle that situation. We'll pause for a moment. Now, there's nothing in that situation that cannot do anything but this illicit pity. Well, you might very well tie it into the lesson. What all has been done or not done back over the years that could have helped create that situation? Of course, we don't know. But something sure did. When you look further at the situation of our lives and sinning against the children. We know that the Jehovah's Witnesses, so-called, believe that taking a blood transfusion is a violation of the Bible's prohibition of eating blood. Acts 15, 29. I don't know whether you know that or not. They probably have been in the news um, more than anybody else that would withhold them for religious reasons medical treatment. There's no way in the world you can say that blood transfusion is eating blood, which is prohibited. That is, having a kidney transplant is eating a kidney. As I say, one of the first rules of biblical interpretation is common sense. Nevertheless, some of those among Jehovah's Witnesses have refused to allow a doctor to give their children or child a blood transfusion. And on some occasions, their children have died. Now, in both of these examples, there could be others used. They sinned against their children. I don't care how sincere they were. They sinned against their children because they would not provide proper, adequate medical treatment. To a person who knows to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. That can come upon a number of things. But then one that's more obvious over the many years that's at least been stemmed to a certain extent, and I will underscore certain extent, is abortions of the unborn. If withholding medical treatment is a sin against a child, then having a doctor to kill an unborn baby it's certainly a sin against an unborn child. It's simply murder in the womb, and that's all there is to it. In America, over 1.5 million babies, it may be a little higher than that, up to our present time, have been killed. And who killed them? A parent or parents. And here's another sin that's working in the families. The Bible talks about it. Mentioned in Romans 1, verse 31. These people are without natural affection. It's hard for me to understand that. The people can see little children, how innocent they are, how defenseless they are, how dependent they are upon their own parents that should be supplying them among humans with the greatest security they possibly can get. And yet, that affection that should be natural to a father and mother, especially a mother, is not there.
Now, when we as Christians have to live in a world that's more and more described in this way, what can we expect? Well, one thing we have to expect is when we try to teach others the truth of the gospel and they come from this kind of background, it won't be as easy as teaching children or even adults who grew up in a family that cared for them and taught them right from wrong, taught them moral or moral matters and taught them correctly, taught them to fear God. They may be wrong in their religious view, but they taught them to fear God. That kind of person has soil, if you want to call it that, that's much more easily cultivated for the seed to be sown in. These are just realities. And have you noticed because they have been around so long, they don't keep me awake at night. How about you? Why? Because we have to live with it. You can't have things like this just completely keeping you on edge all day long every day or you'll drive yourself insane. Thus, we have to cope with it. But the children of God and all that that means with the fortification of the truth should be able to keep that straight. Jesus did. He gave grievous warnings. Children that were abused, be better for the people that abused them, have a millstone tied about their neck and thrown into the sea than to abuse one of these little ones. So what do we do in our homes? We try to cultivate natural affection. We try to cultivate pity. We try to teach to help those who can't help themselves. And if ever a child should have security, it should be in the womb. But that's one of the most dangerous places in the whole country. That's child abuse. And that leads us more directly to what we think of child abuse. That's happening more every day. But that's child abuse too, and I don't want it to be missed. Not that these in this room would miss it. But there are other parents who sin against their children by physical and mental abuse. I think sometimes they're able to handle the physical abuse a lot better than they are the mental abuse. I know in my experience over the years of working with children who were orphaned, they had a terrible time. And dealing with the fact that here I am, not with my family because I can't be with my mother and daddy. The courts had removed them from the home. The mother and daddy had been drug addicts. They did not supply the care. They did not supply the food. They did not supply the clothing. Yet they would stay with us a good while, and you know it's strange how it works in the mind of a child. After a period of months of being away from that atmosphere, they would yearn to be home with their parents. Because your mind has a way of dismissing those bad things. I had one fellow tell me once one time, I don't think he was being totally facetious, but partly he was, talking about getting over homesickness. He said, you know, homesickness, when you remember all the good things back at home. He said, you get over homesickness if you remember the time your daddy took you to the woodshed. <laughs> or you took you there. Now, he he was trying to say, and he was laughing when he said it, you know, there's, there's more to home than all the good things. <laughs> but I don't know how well that worked with me, and in fact, I don't think it did. <laughs> but nevertheless, it shows you how a mind will dismiss those things that are very unpleasant, and sometimes very hurtful, because of what you were meant to have, the security of a home, which does involve proper preventive as well as corrective discipline. I see and read of at times, I try not to because it bothers me, of so-called parents who have not just beat their children unmercifully and treated them in that way, but who have used them to satisfy sexual urges, perverted people. I just, I can't hardly even talk about such a thing now, and yet it's there. And let me say this, if you're going to deal properly and learn how to deal with children today who are in need, you've got to learn to deal with that. 
there are live-in lovers in homes. There are stepfathers. They may be called that. They're involved with a woman with has children. And how often, I don't think a year goes by here in Houston, that we don't read of her some boyfriend hurt a kid or killed a child. Well, those are sins. And those children, even if they live, and many of them do, will grow up as damaged goods. Children can be abused mentally by abusing them verbally. If you constantly berate a child and you're worthless and you're good for nothing and some way or another do that kind of thing, you will destroy that child's self-esteem. How do you cultivate somebody to have natural affection? How do you train that child to care for somebody else and not to hurt somebody else? You have to show it, first of all, with compassion and mercy in the home and the teaching. And you don't always verbally abuse them. In fact, you should never verbally abuse them. Now, what that means is, as I've really already said it, there are a lot of emotionally crippled children that never fully recover. I would say to anybody who had a situation like that, that you're going to have to be especially on guard in your own mind not to look at everybody else like you learn to look at the reality of people who abused you because everybody's not like that. But it'll be very hard not to. It's very hard for children who are raised in a home where one or the other or both parents have terribly abused them verbally, physically, and other ways. Not to just automatically look at people when they get out of the home with a jaundiced look, with a biased look and think of everybody's like that. Well, they're not. So it really will cause one to have to cultivate some very strong, how would you say it, controls not to see in everybody the person that, if you want to call it this, persecuted and abused you. I would like to think that some of these things we've talked about don't appear as much among members of the church. People are people. And people can fall into these categories. And it's one of those things where people will hide it or try to. And yet it will show up somewhere down the line. But in our world of great materialism, we would also say that spoiling a child is a way that you sin against a child. How do you do that? Well, one way is don't restrain them. Just let them do as they please. Do you remember Samuel of the Old Testament as well as Eli of the Old Testament? Now, both of them had children that grew up to be rotten. But Samuel was not condemned by God for the rearing of his children. But Eli was. And that's worthy of saying, what's the difference? Both their children were not faithful to God. And when you study it, 1 Samuel 3.13 in chapter 2, verses 22 through 24, and more specifically verse 29, you'll see that Samuel tried to restrain his sons. But Eli did not. He abdicated his responsibility as a parent. Now that's sinning against the child. The scriptures command parents to provide discipline for, for their children. That's preventive discipline, teaching them the right way to go, exemplifying it before them. But then also when they violate what's right, then there's various kinds of punishment to show them such is not good. 
Proverbs, the book of Proverbs, teaches this. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. He goes ahead to say, the rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother shame. Then the last one. Correct the son, and he shall give thee rest. Yea, he shall give delight unto thy soul. Proverbs 22, 15. And 29, verses 15 and 17, respectively. Now, there's some people that just don't believe those words. They just don't believe them at all. But they're still true. Just because a person doesn't believe the Word of God doesn't change the Word of God. At one time or another, most of us have been around children and the parents did not attempt to restrain. First of all, the parents could be there and didn't even know what was going on with the kids. That involves the parents while they have children, especially at a certain age, of keeping an eye on them. You ever heard that terminology? Know what they're doing. I've seen children, and you have too, and I've seen it growing up. When I was a child, where the kids could get away with anything, 10 feet from the parents, because the parents were too busy to take care of things that had nothing to do with the children to know what the children were doing. I, it will ring in my ears for a long time of what my mother would say because she said it a lot more than once. When I was a teenager, and I don't think I gave them any trouble as far as my conduct in the assemblies and Bible classes, but Mama would see some other child, <laughs> and she would just let me know that if you act like that, then I'll be down there where you are and you'll be coming right back to sit with me. And the whole church will know exactly what happened. And that was told me a lot of times. And it never had to be done because I can't remember a time in the church when I was old enough to remember that happened. But it certainly happened with some. There was, and it was sort of a pitiful situation, Back when I was probably in my early teens, in the congregation back at home, an older couple who had already raised children and had them grown, and all of a sudden here they come along at grandmother's stage and have two more of their own. And those children, well, they just didn't receive much restraint, if any. And this happened one time, and it's humorous, but it's not. Little boys get old enough, you know, you let them go to the restroom on their own. Well, this one little boy who later on died a tragic death, about five, six, seven years old, was allowed to go to the church restroom. He was gone for a while. He came back in through the middle door, wearing the commode seat as a necklace. Well, it seems to me somebody should have been paying a little more attention <laughs> to the whole thing. But that's just mild, as I say, humorous. But I've seen mothers try to talk, we'll put that in quotes, talk to their children to get them to obey them. Well, the children are all that talk, talk for a long time, but knew there wasn't anything to it, and they continue to do just they please. The rod of foolishness, the rod to drive foolishness from them would have helped a great deal. If you love your children too much to correct them, especially when, to use the term of Proverbs, a rod needs to be used, you don't love them at all and quit fooling yourself. I love my children too much to spank them. Where did you ever learn such a thing from God? concerning the way a home ought to be run, the way children ought to be dealt with. If such a parent truly loved his child or her child, you would want to shape their character 
and you'd want them to have respect for others and above all respect for you as a parent. I think you can mark it down that children who are raised to not have any respect for their parents are rarely going to respect God. And they didn't pay attention to their parents' words because they were not taught to and made to. Why should they pay attention to God? For a good while, parents are the only God's children know when they're real little. And that's an important point to keep in mind. Paul said, when I was a child, I was a child, so but when I became a man, I put away childish things. You have, to deal with, you have to deal with children as children. You don't deal with children as adults. So they grow into undisciplined adults who expect to get their way or throw an awful temper tantrum, and our country is full of that right now. If you want to see a whole lot of why for many years now that Young people have fought against the government, burned this up, burned that up, blew that up when they couldn't get their way. Just mark it down to the kind of way they've been brought up. Not in every case, but to a great extent, that's it. After all, what institutions put on this earth to bring children into the world and to rear them, to train them, to teach them, to show them what's right? And that involves restraint. And parents who fail to restrain their children sin against them. We sometimes spoil our children by giving them too much. And that's a lot in this life. I just heard of a person, relatively young person, who was called by a family member on Christmas Day, this past Christmas Day, and said there aren't any presents this year. That sounds so strange in this day and age. And I felt so sorry for somebody like that. Surely with dollar stores around, somebody could have found something in this particular time period. On the other hand, you've got so much stuff poured out. We say along about July, I don't know what I'm going to I get anybody for Christmas. They don't need anything. Well, they need something. It's just they don't need any more presents. They don't know how to appreciate them. Parents and grandparents provide their children and grandchildren with all sorts of expensive toys today. They get this and they get that and they get this and this is available. The thing is not available on their part is appreciation for what they got. Now in contrast to that attitude, children obey their parents on Christmas morning with little of appreciation. How quickly will they take the present they got on Christmas morning and you'll find it out there in the backyard somewhere a little later or you'll find it here. It's completely forgotten. I know these are just stories but it was true of my parents in their day. They did well to get a little candy and an apple and an orange. And that was characteristic of a lot of folks in the 1930s. Daddy said there was a fellow that worked with him who would joke about it when they were working. This would have been back in the 1960s. He said, we were so poor. said, when Christmas came around, Daddy would say, and there's a whole house full of kids, Daddy would say, gather around, children, we're going to cut an orange. <laughs> well, we laugh about that, but people in those days had just that little and there are people today who have that little. But our, our, our materialistic society just pours out everything materially. And yet appreciation just doesn't seem to be there. The children are just simply getting through unwrapping one gift and say, where's the other one? Let's go to it. So by giving our children everything they ever want or attempting to, we're really depriving them of learning to appreciate what they have. How do you think for a moment? How do you do that? How do you teach children to appreciate what they have and to take care of what they've been giving if you don't exercise some sort of discipline and cause them to appreciate it? 
If you ever noticed the song that was, I guess it's 50 years old now, that Dolly Parton wrote, Coat of Many Colors? Surely we've heard that. I think that's as good an example to show how somebody really appreciated something, but the other kids made fun of it. And that happens so often. We need to teach children the world does not revolve around them. A great many parents don't do what's necessary to teach that. And they grow up thinking the whole world is there to satisfy their wants. Become self-centered, self-satisfied, selfish. I think probably we've all visited in homes where adults could not carry on a conversation because children just interrupted the whole affair. And you try to carry on a conversation and the parents are saying, yeah, well, go off play while we talk. Well, that'd be nice to tell them that. But they don't do it then. You say, that's mean. They, ought to, they should be accepted in the home. No, there's times when parents need to be talking on levels with children. You sit there and shut up. Perhaps that's why another generation spoke of the adage, children are to be seen and not heard. I've heard people criticize that because I think they gave it a meaning they never intended in those days, at least most people. What they meant was is that there ought to be respect by the children shown to the parents. And I think we've lost that completely in this nation. This generation is not doing a very good job of teaching children to respect adults, especially children. So there's little respect shown to the elderly. Mark it down. If you think abortion's been a problem, euthanasia for the older folks is peeping around the door. Now why is that going to happen? It just happens. People haven't been taught. And it doesn't take a genius to realize that if I can abort children, there's nothing wrong with that because they're not viable what about elderly folks in nursing homes who are not viable? They're, just, they're a drain on the, on the family. They're a drain on the country. Why not just get rid of them? It's a terrible thing to see elderly men and women be standing while children sit and they've never been taught to stand up and say, would you like to have this seat? They don't even know. In Leviticus chapter 19, verse 2, Moses, or 32, Moses said, Thou shalt rise up before the hoary head and honor the face of the old man and fear thy God. I am the Lord. I've always thought it was interesting that he would say, you know, show respect to the white-headed, honor the face of the old man. Why did he have to put in there and fear thy God? Because they go hand in hand. If you don't have respect for the older folks because of what they've gone through and the life they've lived and so on, why would you have any respect for God? And today you don't in this nation. There's no respect for God. We shall not improve our society by forgetting divine law. It just won't happen. We also see that you can provoke children to anger. And Paul said, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Ephesians 6, 4. He again wrote in Colossians chapter 3, 21, Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Well, how do you provoke your children to anger? I don't think our Lord in the New Testament meant the momentary emotional reaction which occurs maybe when you're spanking a child. He is describing a deep-seated anger that turns into bitterness that we mentioned really early ago when people are bemeaned and put down and called worthless and made to feel worthless. That's improper correction. 
people can become exceedingly angry and it stay in them to where it boils and ferments until it is terrible in the sense that it brings about a bitterness that stays with them forever. So we can be guilty in provoking our children to anger through constant fault finding, even unjust comparisons to their siblings, and through harsher punishment, inconsistent punishment, and on down the line. By not teaching our children good work habits, there's a good one. Paul said in 1 Timothy 5, 8, and I think it's interesting, inspiration had him write it to a young preacher. But if any provide not for his own, especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel, worse than one who doesn't even believe in Christ. Then in 2 Thessalonians 3:10. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. Well, that's a laughing, something to laugh at for our, our time. When everything is taught welfare, what can I get for free, and so on. If one's children have not learned good work habits, so that when they're adults, they can provide for themselves by the time they leave the house, so to speak. One has sinned against them. By not teaching them how to be saved, we have a responsibility as a parent to do that, you know. And if we don't teach them how to be saved, the importance of being saved, then where should they get it first? They should get it from mom and daddy, shouldn't they? Should that be the greatest goal you could have for a child is to be dependable, for them to look to God, for them to prepare their lives to meet God, to encourage them to be obedient to the gospel, to start out as the writer of the Old Testament said, remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not and other days draw nigh. Thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. So if our children reach adulthood without knowing what to do to be saved, we sin against the child. And even if a parent takes the time to teach the children how to drive a car, sometimes at great risk of life and limb, they should also teach their children how to live to please God. Surely it's more important for them to learn how to please God than it is to get a driver's license. Many parents are sinning against their children by not teaching them the right priorities, what comes before something else. Jesus simply said it this way, and we haven't learned it yet, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you, Matthew six thirty three. What do we teach our children? That's what we need to ask. What are we teaching our children? Do we allow them to miss worship and Bible study periods? To attend ball games? I heard the preacher making it clear that that was all right if you could go the next week to a gospel meeting across town and make it up. How do you make up sinning? What about going on dates or staying at home watching TV or playing computer games? Whatever it is, that's all right to do that and put it ahead of church. So are we guilty of teaching our children that nearly everything and anything takes priority over assembling with the saints or doing the Lord's work, whatever it may be? If we're doing that as parents, we're sinning against our children. And of course, the good example that we ought to set, we sin against them when we do that. Jesus said Christians are the salt of the earth and a light of the world, Matthew 5, 13 through 16. Well, there's, there's no part of the world so precious as our children. They should see a good example of what being a Christian is by the lives we live 
by the words we use, by the things we do and the things we don't do and what comes first in their parents' lives. So they should see a good example of what being a Christian is by our lives. Parents who maybe they don't come out and actually say this, but they actually are saying it, do as I say, not as I do, are sinning against the children. The children, why they're so the best imitators could be. And they learn as their parents do. What influence are we going to have on our children? If we curse and use foul language, and that's where they learn it first of all, or we drink alcoholic beverages, or we're on some sort of drugs, we're smoking or we're watching filthy movies or we're gossiping or we're murmuring and complaining and all of that. None of that characterizes a Christian. None of it's sanctioned by the New Testament. And so we must keep in mind they're there absorbing all of it. And then we want them to go to church and worship and study their Bible. Our children are a sacred inheritance from the Lord. So declared the psalmist in Psalm 127 and verse 3. And as with any stewardship, we need to be faithful to the Lord with that which has been entrusted to us. 1 Peter 4 and verse 10. Now, failure to do this will cost us severely. Not only throughout eternity, but it will begin in this life. The wise man wrote, A wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish son is the heaviness of his mother. He that begatteth a fool doeth it to his sorrow, and the father of a fool hath no joy. Proverbs 17:21. So as we end the lesson on this first Lord's Day, of this new year we need to learn to guard ourselves from not only the earthly sorrow that comes from having children in this way by not sinning against the child and understanding how we do it it is a challenge but so is everything about the Christian life thus we plead with all of us, whether we have children at home or wherever they be, to encourage people, if they want to change this nation, then change the children, because that's how the nation got to where it is today. The children were changed many years ago into believing and not believing what they do today. It doesn't just happen by the snap of a finger or by osmosis or something like that. It happens because people work at teaching and training and setting a godly example. It's always been that way, which tells me for many, many years up to this point, somebody dropped the ball a long time ago. We want this nation to be a nation, we say, like it once was. Well, there's always been wickedness in this nation. There's always been ungodly people. But there was enough in this nation who believed in teaching and training a child and having a home as God would have it. An individual responsibility and care for one another to where it kept things going. Well, those things didn't happen either except they were taught and people trained in that way. Well, I would say in the last 60 years, especially the last 50, the training's been right the opposite direction. And much, or maybe I should say it this way, many sins have begun, have begun to take place and happen against the child. If you're not a child of God today, you'll have to discipline yourself to take God at his word to become one. Because that's what belief would entail and repentance and confession of faith in Christ and being baptized to Christ. That takes your submission to 
to God through Christ. Well, as a child of God, what is our submission? What is our attitude? If we failed in that area, we need to repent. Again, submission. Confess those sins and pray God for forgiveness. Well, we all submit to some folks. And he who has all authority in heaven and on earth, who is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by him, John 14, 6. Above all, we should desire to submit to him because he'll never do anybody any ill will. But heaven will be your home when you do. If you're subject to the call of Jesus, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.